Last year, I reviewed the Burson Timekeeper 3i integrated amp with a unique power supply design called the Max Current Power Supply. And despite the integrated amp weighing not much heavier than a regular book, it can output 100 watt in Class AB. Now, for an old man like me, anything that weighs less than 20 pounds is godsend. And that is one of the reasons why I like Class D. Well, that one was Class AB. So when Burson reached out this year, asking me to review their newest monoblock with the max current power supply, I was really excited. Monoblocks! The idea is just so cool. Two dedicated power amps, one for each channel, with only one job. And that is to drive your speakers to the maximum potential. What else can an audiophile ask for more? Not only in theory should it deliver superior sonic performance, but just the look of having two power amps in your room should make any audiophile feel like they've reached the audio world peak. So when Burson told me that I will be the first to get to test their Burson Timekeeper 3X Grand Tour monoblocks, I was both happy and concerned. Happy because I get to test a pair of monoblocks in my room, concerned because it is not heavy as my refrigerator. You see, with the Timekeeper 3i integrated amp, I said in that video the power is okay for its intended purpose. However, for a monoblock, it better have more than just okay power. From my experience, most power amp that uses switching mode power supply are not very muscular. I tolerate it with entry-level Class D amps because that's just how it is. However, the Burst and Grand Tour and Monoblock, look, I'll call it GT from now, is around 3.5 grand. So if it does not deliver more dynamics than the other Timekeeper integrated amp, despite both being rated at 100 watts and 8 ohms, I'm sending it back. Now, the only reason I was hopeful was because they told me they have developed a new power supply called the Burson Supercharger. Supercharger, that sounds pretty bold. I hope it delivers superpower. So when I received the monoblocks, I was scratching my head. It came in one small box. I was like, okay, so is the power supply in another box? You see, this is the size of the power supply of the original Timekeeper 3i. I was expecting two of these. And given they are calling it a supercharger, I was expecting like double the size. But I got this instead. Dude, I think my Xbox power supply is bigger than this. You gotta be kidding me. Last I checked, the lithium crystal have not been invented yet. So they call it the supercharger. So it must be super. You know, as a YouTube reviewer, I always wish companies the best especially a really nice company like Burson. You know, when I reviewed their Timekeeper 3i integrated amp last year, after publishing my video, I sent Burson an email apologizing that I could not give them a review calling the integrated amp the best of the best, best, best. You know, these days, unless the gear can perform 10 times, no, I meant 20 times as asking price, because these days everything performs 10 times its asking price, and unless the gear has been stamped with the best of the best, best, best award from a YouTuber, no one pays attention to it. So I felt bad I could not give them a glowing over the top review. The reason I said Burson is a great company to work with is because they answer me with this, I quote, it is absolutely perfect. We never wanted you to say it's the best of the best, best amp. We wanted people to discover it as a great all-rounder, and that message was very clear in the review. Now, we respect you because of your honesty, and a lot of people value your approach instead of those making extreme claims with each and every review. End quote. Thank you, person, for all your roses. You can imagine my concern when I took the power supply out of the box. So, I plugged it in, powered up, and within minutes, I was typing an email to my audio buddies. Dude, you gotta listen to this. It is incredible what these monobox can do with a power supply the size of a cell phone. So, my audio buddies, today, we are gonna talk about the Burson Grand Tour monoblox with the Super Saiyan power supply.
So just like all my other videos, I will let you know if I'm getting paid or not. Now for this review, Burson did not tell me, Hey Thomas man, 50 bucks every time you mention the word best, 100 bucks every time you mention the word OMG. I did however get an email from them a few days ago asking me to forward this sample to the next reviewer and they will send me a final production version later. I did not confirm with them, does it mean I get to keep the final version? Or if they just wanted to show me how the final version is, given the one I have now has some minor bugs. Now, as you know, 70% of my videos are free because, you know, besides online stores, I don't expect to get paid or keep anything. Now, if I do, I will put it in the description box even after the video is published. So the Burson Timekeeper 3X Grand Tourer outputs its first 30 watts in class A, then it switches to class AB. Now, interestingly, it has two power settings, 55 watts and 180 watt at 4 ohms. Now, why do they call it 3X Grand Tourer? Is it because it performs 3x its asking price? Heck man, they should have just called it 10x then. The amp has RCA and XLR inputs, weights a ridiculous 5kg. That's crazy because in the world of Class A monoblocks, that's like a feather. The unit does come with these really cool stands. And I love the fact you can stand them up to save space. So how does it sound? I would say overall neutral. The top end is not tilted up, not bright, nor is it dark. The mid-range is where it is interesting. It does have that Class A flavor. Now, although not as linear as some of my single-ended Class A tube amps, nor it is as warm, I do, however, hear enough of that Class A sound that if you recognize that linearity and it's what you are chasing after, you will appreciate it more than someone who has never listened to Class A amps. The unit does feel pretty snappy and responsive. Bass is fast dynamic and strong. This was what I was hoping for. Sure, not as strong as my double the price 200 watt Macintosh, but strong enough to the point where I don't have that dreaded feeling that I have sometimes with some Class D amps, where I go like, come on Scotty, give me a bit more power. None of that. Now the background is pretty dark, especially if you're coming from tubes. Yeah, you will notice that right away. It has good instrument separation, a deep and multi-layer soundstage, but above all, a very big soundstage. In short, everything you wanted from an audiophile amp is all there. So what should you be aware of if you plan on buying this amp? First, the unit has a fan. It's class A after all, and it sounds a bit like a computer with a quiet fan. Now the version I have here is the pre-production version, and they told me the final version will be quieter. The second thing you should be aware of is when I let two of my audio buddies at Toronto, Mr. Onyx and Mr. 707, tried it, they told me it sounded thin. The hell? This was surprising because none of us here in Montreal felt that. It must be because of all the Toronto dim sum they've been eating. Now, I did not get a chance to listen to the Burson GT at their place, so I had to figure this out when I got back to Montreal. Now, this is important because it is possible some of you may experience the same. Now, this is my logical deduction. Okay, so let's start with Mr. Onyx. He has these really nice tube monoblocks that cost like almost twice the price of the Bursa GT. Now, fortunately, I own the same monoblocks, but I have the pre-production version. Now, recently, when I was testing the Pearl Acoustic Sibelius speakers, I noticed that out of all the amps I have, the Onyx tube monoblocks have the thickest and warmest sound. Okay, so it is understandable the Burson GT, which is more on the neutral side, would sound leaner. Now that got me thinking about the Class A sound. So let me ask you, what is typical of the Class A sound? In my past videos, I would say Class A sounds lean. Not thin, but lean. However, after chatting with some of my audio buddies, I revised my description to Class A has that linear sound. It has body, and some would call that warmth, and it never sounds fat. Now, if I think of it as muscle fat, Class AB would be like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Class A would be like Bruce Lee. So whenever I listen to Class A amps, most of the time, not all the time, I can hear that linearity. So if your current amps happen to be a Class AB amp with a lot of fat like a vintage Macintosh amp, yeah, get ready to go through a transition period with the Burson GT or any Class A amp. 
Next, what about Mr. 707? I suspected it was gear matching. And to confirm my suspicion, I went to see Mr. Cantor because they both have the same Audio Research LS25 preamp. Also, I was curious to test how the Burson would sound in Mr. Cantor's current MSRP $60,000 high-end system. You see that the Mr. Cantor system was made out of the Audio Research Reference 6 SE preamp, the RLX streamer, the Audio Research Reference 75, and the Focal Sopra 2 speakers. Now, once I put in the Burson to replace the Audio Research Reference 75 amp, Mr. Cantor and my first reaction was like, darn, yeah, it is a bit on the lean side. That Audio Research Reference 6 preamp has zero MSG. Clarity is off the charts and extremely neutral. If there's such a thing as being able to measure the sound of a preamp, it probably measures like ruler flat. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of this kind of sound. And the person already has that class A-ish linear mid. So once you pair it with a colorless neutral preamp with zero fat, yeah, not a good match. So next, we try with the Audio Research LS25. A bit better this time, but still on the cool side of neutral. Now, I remember Mr. Cantor looked at me and asked, hey, uh, are you going to send it back? In my heart, I was glad my suspicions were correct. And I was also telling myself, Mr. Cantor, man, wait till you hear it with a good matching preamp. So I then asked Mr. Cantor to match it with his VTL 2.52 preamp. And okay, guys, now I'm going to transition to the positives. 10 seconds into the first song, Mr. Cantor was like, oh, yeah, man. This feels different and there is bass. After just one song, Mr. Cantor turned to me and asked, are you going to buy it? This experience had me conclude that preamp matching is really important because the rest of the night we keep testing it with different preamps. We even tested it on the legendary Moran 7C tube preamp, which alone is worth a video. Yeah, maybe someday. I know, I know some of you would say, well, no kidding, Sherlock's. Preamp matching is obviously important. You should have just asked me, Thomas. I could have saved you the trip and tell you, you know, that is important. Now, when the preamp matching is good, the performance is quite impressive. You see, I also had Mr. Quad tested and Mr. Jazz at their place. Now, Mr. Jazz was particularly impressed with the nuances and the imaging. While with Mr. Quad, I have an interesting story to tell you. Okay. Last year, Mr. Quad helped me review the Timekeeper Integrated Amp, and he told me that Integrated Amp simply did not work with his electrostatic Quad 2905 speakers. For me, that is fine, because Quad speakers require a lot of current and are not easy to drive. When I reached out to Mr. Quad this year, asking him to test these monoblocks for me, he was obviously very skeptical. Come on, man! These monoblock uses laptop-sized chargers. There is no way it can drive the quads. You need a warp engine for that. Me, on the other hand, after seeing how the monoblocks were able to make my super hard-to-drive 86 dB Compound 4 from Dying Audio, I was pretty confident these monoblocks will impress Mr. Quad. So you can imagine the big smile on my face when I got a text from him one morning describing how the quads surprised him. I don't know, perhaps it's the high current design or whatever. His quads were singing and he found it amazing. The soundstage was enormous and had 3D multi-layer. The background was dark. The top end was refined, smooth and non-aggressive. Voices were beautiful without any exaggeration and it sounded natural. Bass was excellent, deep, powerful, precise, while still having a softness to them. As he said, what a difference. Now at my place, I tried it with more than six speakers. One of the things I tested was volume and power. You see, recently I reviewed the Sibelius and its sensitivity of 87 dB is actually perfect for testing different power amps because it's not too hard to drive, but not easy to drive. I loved it with my 10 watt Luxman SQ15N to integrate the amp because that combo has excellent tone. But it was not my first choice for symphonies. Now, once I switch from the Luxman to the Burson GT for symphonies, it really brings it to another level. So what about if the speaker has a high sensitivity like 96 dB? So one afternoon, Russ and I were testing my 96 dB single driver as player speaker. And sure, it sounded great with the 10 watt Luxman. 
However, the second we put the Bursa GT in, we can tell when it comes to symphonies, there is an improvement in dynamics, control, heft, and that sense of effortlessness. As I told Russ, the problem with us is we can A-B test them. If you just listen to the 10 watt Luxman with the exemplar speakers, it is fine. I guess a bit like until you eat filet mignon, a hamburger patty is just fine. Now, I spent a day testing six speakers with Russ, and we both agree. The more difficult a speaker is to drive, the more life this person can bring to the presentation. So given there are so many options out there, why choose the Bursin GT? Why not an integrated AMP solution instead? This is a discussion I had with my audio buddies. So first, the Bursin monoblocks will allow you to change op amps and it will change the sound significantly. Now, if you want to add more warmth, you can change the Bursin Vivid op amps to the Bursin Classic op amps. With that, sharpness is toned down, it's more musical, you get a fatter bass and warmer mids. So if the Class A linear sound is not fat enough for you, change the op amps. Russ and I prefer the included Vivid op amps because it was more transparent, airier, and it felt faster. Now you can go purchase different op amps from different companies and just like tube rolling, you can op amp rolling. Number two. It is small, light, and has a high spousal approval factor. For some of you who are married, that approval factor is probably on the top of your list when choosing an amp. It has that modern industrial look that I'm sure some of you like. Number three, it does check all the audiophile boxes in terms of sound, especially that snappy, quick, responsive feel. Number four, it does have that class A linear sound flavor. And as you know, Class A amps are not cheap. Usually they're bloody heavy and hot enough to turn your room into a sauna. So, not this one. Number five. One question Russ asked me is, do I prefer separates or integrated? Now, I told him I don't really care because seriously, man, if you blind test me, there's no way I can tell you system A is separate, system B is integrated, impossible. However, with separates, I, can, I have more flexibility. Now with the Bursin GT, the sound of the system can change dramatically depending on the preamp. I matched it with, for example, Bursin combined with Doge 8.2 preamp. It was detailed, warm, and airy. With my Bemaster 897, it was less airy, but it had a darker background. Now with my Exosound DAC E28 plugged directly into the Bursin GT, the mid-range had more body and was more smooth. So what kind of sound signature you get with the Bursin GT will depend on your preamp. All right, so let's wrap it up at this point. Now I have to agree with Mr. Quad that it is quite impressive what that small power supply can do. You know, I wonder in 50 years, will all power amps use this kind of small power supply, regardless if it's class A, A, B, or D? Who knows? With technology improving so fast, I would not be surprised it would. Perhaps we are looking at the dawn of a new age. Now, as some of you know, I am currently working on bringing a tube integrated amp to market. If I had a magic lamp, I would wish for a power supply that weights like a pack of instant noodles. So you can imagine what was going through my head when I first power up the Bursin GT. I would love to have my amp built with this kind of power supply and A-B tested against one with a standard power supply. Guess what? I actually emailed Burson asking them to license me the technology. The point I'm trying to make here is that I was so impressed with it that I actually asked them. Of course, this is for a distant future project. Now, for those of you who are concerned, if your preamp and speaker will be a good match with the Burson GT, they do have a 30 days trial period so, although you have to pay for shipping and a restocking fee, you can test it with a certain level peace of mind. You know, they should have just sent me the matching preamp and I could have told you if it is a good match or not. Now, remember, don't buy something just because a reviewer says it is good. Consider it only if the strength of the unit is what you're looking for. Yes, the person have a lot of strength, so just make sure that those strengths are what you're looking for. So, till next time.
My cause is not defined Only kiss me